We're joined once again by the author of the tales of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, Mr. Stephen Erickson. Welcome back to the show, Stephen. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you for, for coming back. You know, I, one of the things that, uh, I ha that I've become aware of as I've gotten further and further into your work and, and looking up and through these books, you know, being fearful of spoilers, I've been tentative in my Googling, but uh, I, I just love how accessible you are to your readers and how much you are available and how much, how generous you are with your time. So uh, thank you for that. Well, it, it's a thing that, you know, it didn't exist for, for previous generations of writers, right? We, we were very much uh, isolated. Um, and so generally, you know, you would you'd make an appearance at a convention or, or something along those lines, or you would be on a book signing tour, but publishers basically don't do those things anymore. They're, um, they're, they're uh, loss leaders in, in terms of the investments. And, and what this has allowed here um, with the internet is uh, the opportunity for for the writer to actually engage directly with with their audience, um, and I, I consider it a privilege. And but it is a new phenomenon, and, and it's, uh, you know not all writers are, are comfortable doing that for sure. Yeah, well, it's I mean it's very cool from our perspective because we get so much insight in it. It you know humanizes the the writing process in a really interesting way. So. I'm excited to dig into all that with you more today cool. here, our third conversation. Um, but, you know, bringing up that stuff, uh, a question occurred to me that we didn't talk about before, Lana, and that is, mm -hmm. do you do, have you done in the past readings from your own work, in, you know, in these kind of tours? Yeah, I've done, I did, um, I've done readings in, in I guess, in, in world fantasy um, conventions. Um, and at, at ICFA, which is um, the International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts. It's mostly academics um, and a handful of, of us token writers. And and so I've done readings there. Um, I don't really want to do readings anymore. Uh, I yeah. get invited to do readings and I, I turn them down. So mm. uh, I'm, I'm not sure why. I just um, I just don't. It's strange. <laughs> well, I was curious what, you know, when, when you have done them, mm -hmm. what... What sections do you choose? I mean, or what types of sections do you choose? I've I've tried a variety. So I've tried, um, I guess, serious, heavy stuff. And then I've tried com comedic stuff. Um, and I think these days I would prefer, if I was forced to give a reading, I would give a comedic reading rather than a heavy one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. I also, and we didn't talk about this, but just in inspired by sort of, what we were jamming on a bit just before we hit record. Uh, you know, you are writing a ton and you are sort of immersing yourself in the community of this world you've been building. Do you feel like your interactions with the community have changed at all the, the way you write or, or the types of things you'd be interested in writing about? In what ways does your choice to engage with the community in the way that you do sort of, has it affected you? That's a good question. Um, if it has, not consciously. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I'm always sort of hyper aware of uh, the fact that writing is communication. So there's, it, it, it's implicit that you've got a, a, an audience. And that hyper awareness is, is that I, I need to be respectful of that audience. Um, and so if I'm going to make choices in, 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 in the storytelling, in the fiction, um, I need to have thought them through to the extent that I can, I can justify those choices, if asked, mm -hmm. uh, you know, under any circumstances. Um, and I know, I know uh, maybe more so in the past than, than now, but I know of a lot of writers who um, feel no obligation to do so. And that's fair enough. I mean, if, they write for themselves, um, at least that's the presumption. Um, and and so, yeah, they're they're, um, they're not really sort of ready to engage uh, on that level of, of discourse regarding their work. Mm -hmm. And so, quite often, you know, in a panel or something like that, <clears throat> um, even panels where you know we're supposed to be talking, well, we are talking to academics, say at ICFA, um, 
instead of actually engaging in, in the process of writing, um, there's a kind of a, a mystical air is, is, is presented that, you know, um, these things, can, these aspects of process uh, cannot be cannot be queried, cannot be questioned, cannot be challenged, and all those kinds of things. And that always frustrated me. Um, I'd rather talk about writing, but that I've, I've, I've since been told that, yeah, I'm a bit um, weird that way. Uh, I, I think. Well, I, yeah, I love no, it. I think, I, 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 go yeah, ahead. No, sorry. I think Abercrombie, um, he describes me as some kind of, um, I don't know what it was. Uh, what was the phrase? I don't know. He'll probably <clears throat> coin it somewhere else now. Um, but a kind of um, a hyper geek um, uh, when it comes to writing and the writing process. So. I. Well, as fellow hyper geeks, we uh, we salute you. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, my really good buddy Ryan Duff, and he had a talk about game development that, like, very similarly, you know, some devs care about the community, some don't care. Some animators specifically, they're doing what feels good and not what makes mm -hmm. sense. And he has a big talk about caring that people care because they will notice and they will feel it. Um, I hope yeah. so. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Well, well I one love, of the thing. I, no, oh, go, go ahead. ahead sorry. Well, I was oh. going to build on that just because uh, it kind of feeds right into the one, one of the questions we, were, we had talked about, which was, you know, I, we love uh, hearing you talk about writing. It's one of the reasons that we love having these conversations and, um, and how much, as you said, how much thinking you've put in to each aspect, the, the macro themes and, you know, how much, how intentional everything is. But then you also talk about the discovery process. Uh, along the way. And I, I wonder if you could speak to that balance of having clear intention and, and planning versus discovering it in the, in the process of writing. Yeah. I think, I think I learned early on that if you over plan something, um, it kind of loses, uh, it's, it's, it's spark. Um, so if you, if you're just doing, you know, spend three years or five years taking notes, uh, on your novel, you've just, you've sucked the life out of it basically. Um, so I, I kind of learned to, to restrain myself in that I, I, I have some general ideas. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I'm fairly clear on uh, why I would, you know, um, apply those ideas. Um, so my rationale for doing so. But I leave, I leave the details open so that um, there is an element of spontaneity um in the writing process because that's that's where i get my entertainment um otherwise i'm just taking dictation and that actually doesn't really work so yeah. i mean to apply it to the house of chains um because there is a, a kind of a, a macro thing that's going on here um after i finished memories of ice i could see that less so with gardens of the moon but dead house gates and memories of ice we're kind of ramping things up in terms of scale so that by the end of uh, Memories of Ice, um, we were dealing in, in you know, uh, military engagements involving tens of thousands. And even that, I had a sense that I was, I was pushing the limits on that. Um, so I did not want to fall into a, a predictable pattern in terms of, I knew I had um, this idea of convergence, but the convergence is diegetic. It's built into the world. So it's understood as, as an aspect of what can happen in the world if you, if you have active gods, is that power draws power and things get messy really quickly. Um, so that structurally was always going to be kind of running parallel to um, the whole notion of the climax of a story. So that, that made sense. Um, I did not want to, I could see that there was a scaling up process going between Dead House Gates and Memories of Ice. And I thought if I, if I hit the reader with a, 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 another scaling up process by the end of House of Chains, I'll have set a pattern of expectation uh, for the rest of the series, which, mm. you know, could not be, could not be physically met. I mean, um, Memories of Ice uh, really sort of stretched stretched my my abilities um there was so much going on in that story and so many um threads that were sort of coalescing in the end of the book 
and then of course there's well there's two elements there's one if you up the scale so that you're now talking um, not just thousands of, of soldiers or whatever but tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands it, the, the number becomes abstract and when it becomes abstract then the emotional attachment sort of diminishes <clears throat> so you know you look at history books and you read about uh, you know incidences of, of genocide or whatever and, and the numbers just it's kind of hard to comprehend them unless there's a personal connection uh, to those events. Um, and then the second, the second prob problematic aspect to upping the scale is logistics. Um, the logistics of maintaining, you know, an army of, of a quarter million soldiers. Um, it, it's impossible, especially in a, a pre-industrial agrarian subsistence basis. Um, I remember. Me and Cam, we, we were having dinner with Glenn Cook once in, in a convention, and he was just railing about that. He just said, you know, the numbers that he was seeing were just absurd in a lot of fantasy novels because the, pop, the environment cannot support that kind of, that kind of um, size of armies. Um, <clears throat> my counter argument to him was, you look at a lot of his, uh, ancient histories, and when the... the, the uh, engagements and campaigns are described all the numbers are exaggerated um, they would have to be so you know there is that fallback but at least in history there's there's uh, the basic foundational belief system is these events occurred and so there's an element of reality to it uh, um, even though the numbers have been, been inflated but in in, in, a, in a fictional novel set in a secondary world there is no assumption of, of a base reality right it's it's all yeah. it's all created it's all invented they're elves they don't need to eat yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 elves yeah. elves living in a in a, a temperate rainforest and, and <laughs> right. you know i i've walked enough temperate rainforests to know that you know unless you guys are are eating salmon uh, you're going hungry yeah. <laughs> yeah. so i i love you sort of talking about this this build up and then needing to, you know, ch change things up. I think it's very interesting. Uh, you know, as we started this novel, the community's commentary was like, all right, get through it. And then the next one's so good. But Jeff and I talked about last week how we both loved that it built and built. And then the end was this, this small moment, this, this very personal place for Fels and Tavor. And obviously that being like that big, pivot so did you know is this one of those things that you sort of knew but didn't over plan that it would always come down to the two of them or did you just know that it was going to be something smaller no it, it it was after memories of ice i realized that i had to um i had to pull the focus all the way down to two individuals that was my answer to that scaling up uh expectation mm -hmm. um and i also understood that or realize that this is going to be not a knockdown drag them out action sequence battle between these two these two sisters mm -hmm. uh, that that the core of it was going to be pathos rather than anything else yeah you and mentioned so, it. oh sorry go ahead no, go i was ahead. gonna say you mentioned in in your comments on the video as well that you spent a ton <clears throat> of time getting that scene yeah, yeah. just right can you uh, talk more about that um well, that's more, I guess, craft related than anything else. Um, it's it's uh, sentence length. It's 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 uh, adhering to the specific point of view and, and keeping that extremely limited. Did um, you always know it was going to be from Felicity's point of view? Yes. Um, <clears throat> when I when I sort of visualized that final scene, I. I in a sense, I, I saw it through through the bars of the cage of her helmet. So then I realized that this has to be from her point of view, um, and that, so that the helplessness is the predominant uh, sensibility when you're reading it, as opposed to Tavor's ultimate confidence, right? Because if it was her confidence, then it's just it it kind of flattens itself because she has no real. Uh, no equal 
uh, standing across from her in terms of sword play and abilities and all the rest. So if that came from her point of view, that scene would, would not have worked. Mm-hmm. It had to come from um, the, uh, the point of view of uh, the helpless participant in, in, in this collision of forces. Yeah, you also mentioned in your your comment on our video about how it it recalls uh, her comments after Bowden's death about mm. the with the armor. Is that mm. one of those things that sort of uh, presents itself to you mm-hmm. as as a, a serendipity, or is it something that you planned from the word go back in that other novel? Um, it's kind of a combination of the two. Uh, um, the planned element comes after sort of the creation of, of the specific details. You know, uh, when, when I talk about my writing process, um, I describe it as elliptical. Um, and so quite often, be, in terms of describing it as elliptical, is that something happens, say, at the beginning of a scene. It's a description of, of something in the setting or character action or something along those lines. And... And this is where, you know, it's being invented on the fly. But then when you look back over it, you see, you can sort of recognize that, okay, there is an element there that is, in a sense, ringing a bell. Or I could think of it as ringing a bell. And if it's a strong enough element, then at some later point, by the end of the scene, or the end of the chapter, or the end of the novel, I can ring that bell again. And the tone is not exactly the same, because there has been you know, events have occurred and there's been development of characters and and things have changed, but it does echo uh, that initial refrain. Um, So I think the the whole um, Bowdoin death sequence, um, that armor um, theme played itself up. Um, And it was for, in that circumstance, it wasn't physical armor, it was the armor of uh, her psychically defending herself from having been put into uh, the mines and, and all the rest. And it was that armor that was basically um, allowing her to feel at least protected enough so that you know her uh, exchanges with all these people around her, with Heboric and, and Bowden, um, could be aggressive as opposed to completely submissive um, or helpless. Mm-hmm. So it, it became a kind of a, um, a source of, of strength for her. And of course, then, so that that kind of scene worked out in, in a metaphorical sense, sort of organically. It just, it built itself up from there. And that's the spontaneity aspect of things. But then it was enough for me to remember that that's a really nice bell to echo with her final scene um, as she gets into somebody else's armor. Um, and it fails her utterly. <sighs> this scene was so powerful to me. And so I apologize that I have like more questions just specifically about this no, no, one no. moment. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> but again, around the, this like spontaneity versus like al- always knowing, um, you know, one of these threads, uh, people discussed again in our comment section was something that was the foundation was laid for it back in gardens of the moon with good news, initial mm-hmm. death and then non-death because of Opon's mm-hmm. switcheroo. Um, and Opon saying, Oh, somebody in your shadow is going mm-hmm. to take this fall for you. Is that a moment where that door was left open? So you're like, eh, somebody who's in a shadow and then we'll fill that in. Or is you was this a moment um, where you're like, this is the intertwined fate of these Peron siblings. I know it's going to come to pass. Fellison's gonna. It's a good question. Um, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> I would like to tell you that um, our, I was already aware of Felicity's fate in House of Chains, but I don't remember. Um, <laughs> so, if it was a case of me um, just throwing that out there as as an open possibility, uh, then I was very lucky. <laughs> <You know. laughs> There's no other way to describe it. Um, <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So it's so resonant. And it's one of those things that if I if I could remember 
you know, if mm. I could give myself one superpower just for 2024, it would be to remember in perfect detail every moment of these books <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that I could do those yeah. callbacks. Um, yeah, but no, it was, I mean, it, yeah, mm. it's, it's, it would be uh, a kind of disingenuous retcon if I were to say, yeah, you know, with absolute certainty that I, I was completely aware of what I was setting up in Gardens of the Moon with Gatos Peran. Yeah. Uh, and and his siblings, but I just don't remember. Um, yeah. That's very honest of you. I, you know, if it was me, I would have been like, "Yes, I." <laughs> it was all the master plan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've had that situation myself in 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 creative uh, endeavors. You know, my D and D campaign and stuff mm-hmm. like that, where you, you you're setting yourself up for something, but you did you don't know you're doing it. In yeah, retrospect, Chuck, yeah. oh my gosh, I set myself up for that, but I didn't know I was doing that. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's that's one of the most mysterious things about the creative process. Um, yeah, and sometimes it feels like it magic. Makes, <laughs> yeah, it makes me suspect that, you know, all this stuff is 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 already written. You know, it's already <laughs> in the head somewhere. And uh, we, our instinct, it, it taps into um, that already pre-existing storyline. Um and and my experience has been even within a short story um, that so often is it's so often the case that whatever I, I laid out in the opening of, of that story is absolutely perfect for the end of that story <laughs> and that's on the first draft and yeah. it's kind of um, it's a little bit uh, disorienting it's a bit alarming because <laughs> you're thinking well did I write this or or am I just literally taking dic- dictation. Uh, from some subconscious element, um, one that actually, you know, sits outside, you know, time and space, basically, you know, it's it's just, um, so I, yeah, I I don't have an answer for that, but I I do trust it. Um, and I've learned to trust it over time that, um, if something is, is, is forcing, forcing me to focus on it, um, I, I, I've learned to, to have faith in that. Mm-hmm. Um, that there's a reason for it. Um, but, you know, the, the, the other thing about um, that final sequence with, um, you know, the, the, the most direct house of chains, which is the family, um, between Tavor and, and uh, Felicin, is that it's, it's actually, I mean, less is more. And that mm-hmm. was the other thing I learned uh, in that process. Uh, um you can, you can, by that point, you can, you can weight each sentence, each word far more than you could if that were at the beginning of a novel, hmm. because you don't have all that, uh, characterization, all that, um, development that's gone on, uh, of the storyline, which is, <clears throat> it's like, it's dragging all those chains, all those themes are being dragged into this one point. Um, yeah. and, and, and that point, that's why it takes so long because, each sentence has to carry the weight of all of that yeah, uh, and be able to sustain it. Well, I think that's why I love this novel. Most of the four we've read so far mm-hmm. is because it really does feel like every single thing. It is a convergence, right? Everything had to happen just like that. We had to get to the point where the whirlwind goddess is, is uh, defeated just in that moment, the worst possible moment for Felicin. And we have to have uh, Lestara Yill and, and Pearl get that information in this roundabout way and be there to witness it. And ha- like all that stuff converges to mm-hmm. heighten the tragedy mm-hmm. of that moment. And it's so masterful and, and, and beautiful and poignant. Um, well, 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 you two are in, in a minority, right? Most people don't <laughs> like the fourth book at all. Right? We're well, shocked by I, that. We are- I cannot... I was like, you know, we got to that last chunk of the book and I was like, I guess this is where it turns into a book that we don't just love. <laughs> and then realizing, like, I mean, your sense about, oh, I have to not make this a big battle because people expect that. It seems like, well, people have already expected it. And that's yeah. like where the mood comes from. But yeah. it's just Somebody in the comments, I'm so sorry, I, I forget the name, always says Jeff and I are the target market, baby. And I love being <laughs> target the, audience, target, yeah. the target audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
yeah, I'm pleased to be so. But I also find it, I mean, I don't know if we just need to commiserate about what other people think. But, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, I find it so, uh, so surprising and kind of baffling, frankly, uh, that people have such a hard time when you delve into these kind of darker, more morally mm. ambiguous uh subjects because or sequences because it seems so clear to me where the sort of moral center of the universe is which is clearly uh, on the side of compassion and mm -hmm. humanity and and mercy um and I, I feel like it's yes these things are, are uncomfortable to face at times but that's kind of the point and i find them to be so powerful and it's never it's never the kind of thing where I'm asked to, simp you know, asked to sympathize or, or, or I, it's not, it's never not clear why I'm in this experience. Mm -hmm. And I find I, it so strange yeah. that people recoil so strongly. Um, are you referring to Bidithal? Bidithal, you know. Um, Akarsa at the beginning, the first. Yes, the all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh Okay, so I remember um, when I was studying anthropology, um, we were sort of coming out of uh, that particular discipline's um, crisis. Um, and that crisis was the recognition that, that anthropology, even as a, as a discipline, as a subject, was born from colonialism. Mm. And there are built into you know, its found, foundational structure uh, are, are a lot of colonial notions um, in the study of, you know, quote, lesser cultures, you know, or primitive peoples, etc. And even the terminology was suspect. So then there was a kind of a, a pendulum swing in the opposite direction of, of cultural relativism, which is basically to say that whatever occurs in, you know, a particular culture um, has an inherent legitimacy to it. Um, and I remember as a young student, relatively young anyways, um, recoiling um, on, on, a, on a moral or ethical um, stance or basis uh, from that notion of, of uh, hands off on, on what another, another culture is engaged in with its own people. Even though I understood that there were mechanisms within those cultures that were, you know, reaffirming that status quo generation after generation. So a lot of House of Chains is actually addressing uh, colonialism and post-colonialism as it relates to cultural relativism. So um, uh, genital mutilation is, is in our world, um, prevalent in some places uh, in the world, in, in some cultures. Um, mm -hmm. And quite often it's um, the actual physical act is not conducted by, say, for with regard to female genital mutilation, um, female circumcision, whatever. Um, it's, not, it's not conducted by men. It's conducted by the older generation of women. Um, and so you don't know to what extent you're looking at epigenetic trauma or basically, it's just being repeated over and over again. Um, and, and so I wanted to sort of explore those ideas. Um, and then I realized that somewhere in there, there was going to have to be um, an answer to it. And it, it occurred to me that there, the answer could not come from the Malazan Empire because that would be... Um, a decidedly colonial response, right? Um, so if it couldn't come from, you know, a, a, an element that's coming from another neighboring civilization or culture or whatever, um, the only place that answer could come from would be the one individual who rejects civilization and rejects mm. culture. Um, or he doesn't, he ends up having to reject his own culture, um, the process that Carsa goes through. So it had to be from Carsa. He was the only yeah. one who could give answer to, to what Bitterhall uh, was doing because he didn't give a flying fuck about 
cultural relativism, you know, <laughs> or, <laughs> right, right. Or, or, respecting... or much of anything else for that yeah, matter. Or much of anything else, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he, he was the, he was the, he was that agent that just said, you know, enough enough with the the semantics and the bullshit. Um, this is what I'm going to do. And so once I realized that that he was going to be that that almost natural force mm. of, yeah. of of justice, if you will, um, mm-hmm. yeah, then I could sort of um, not worry about any kind of um, colonial ethnocentrism applying to the um, justice that's delivered um, against Bidithal. Yeah. And, it, and it seems like Karsa's journey is that of sort of discovering a mm-hmm. new moral center, right? Mm-hmm. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. And even knowing yeah. that Karsa like, was going to be the person delivering this like as you get read through the scene, being like Cars is doing this, like his history of both brutality but also swift <laughs> murder. I was like, mm-hmm. let's go. A standing ovation yeah. in my bedroom. It was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he had to be he had to be the the instrument of of, of that change. Um, but also, I mean, he arrives he arrives in the entire camp um, like this this you know. Uh, intractable force um, that simply tears up, breaks apart all of those um, civilized constructs of, of uh, um, conspiracy and, and politics and maneuvering and all that kind of stuff. He just, he just shatters it all. Basically. Yeah. Well, the, mm-hmm. we talked about that in the chapters leading up to it, you know, mm-hmm. it felt like this convergence was happening and here comes this wild card. Here comes Carso <laughs> Orlong. And it's what's so also so great about it is that, He's not just coming to get the characters we don't like. He's going to be doing that, but he yeah. also wants to kill Habori, you know, like a character we kind of like. And we, you know, so he's, you know, he's just a chaos engine and it's, it's great. Yeah. 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 He would have to be indiscriminate on this one. Um, well, not, not indiscriminate. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Indifferent to the audiences. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, attitudes towards allegiances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, um, Karsa is, I mean, I loved the journey that he went on through the whole book. Uh, one of the things I found was very interesting, not just his sort of moral journey and his his like learning and understanding about his culture and you know the juxtaposition of what he knows versus the collective world's mm-hmm. knowledge that he's gaining, but also a journey of sort of his his power level um, in a sense where at the beginning of the book, you know, he's the strongest frat bro in the town Mm -hmm. and then he goes out and he's obviously this massive dude takes, takes out a bunch of people in the town, but ultimately it's kind of like taken down by, you know, Mm -hmm. the atotoral net and a a gaggle Mm -hmm. of molasses. Um, But later he, you know, is breaking the jaws of the two most ancient, powerful puppet dogs of shadow. Mm -hmm. Um, as Warrens are shifting and changing and gods are entering this, this pantheon that you've created, how do you keep perspective on the power levels within the different characters in the world? Oh, wow. Um, that's a good question. I mean, Karsa um, is coming from a culture that traditionally absorbs a tatterol. So right. you know, that's the blood oil. Um, mm-hmm. And, so he was going to be uh, an individual who could just push his way through sorcery, um, which, you know, uh, gave him an advantage um, over, you know, sorcerers who thought their sorcery would be efficacious against him. You know? So they'd be <laughs> shocked, right? As he just walks right through it. Um, but of course, as much as, as, you know, he is this sort of physical force of, um, a kind of indomitable will. Um, internally, he's being completely dismantled, and, and that's part of his process, right? Um, mm-hmm. What did you think of the first four chapters? I mean, because there was such an outlier in, in terms of the, the narrative style. I mean, to me, it was one of my favorite writing periods uh, of the yeah, entire we, uh, of the entire series. We lo- we loved them. Um, yeah. I. I, I the the uh, the narrow focus and and constrained POV is is I adore being inside that because 
it it allows you the reader to kind of have a little more knowledge than the character sometimes you know you're like i i see what he thinks it is but i know what it really is and yeah. there's a joy in that that's really fun and all of the way that you um you change your use of language to convey how how the thought and expression of this culture this subculture in a larger fantasy culture uh, it's I don't know. I'm in, in awe of it. And I also, I, I delight in reading it because it, it, it allows you to sort of step into this other place that is even distinct from these other, other places that we've been in, uh, you know, mm. the previous novels. Anyway, Lana, yeah. what, what is yeah. your reaction? I loved the, like the journey as a reader being in somewhere that felt so different and trying so hard to place myself in the world and looking for any little clue. What, time are we in in the timeline like what era of this world are we mm. and and even like the realization as you go forward it's like oh a lot of these like lowland children it's like oh those are just humans and they're all children because like the more context like the more Carsa's context it's like a little journey that Carsa's going on of like his world gets huge from like his his village to the world my understanding of Carsa blossomed into this funnel of mm. where he, he sits and what he sort of represents. And just thinking of that, you know, moment where he's uh, sort of invulnerable to like sorcery, like that first flash of like, like fire. And he's like, oh, I'm fine anyway. And just kind of mm -hmm. scoots past. It was so mm. amazing and not something we'd, we'd seen in, in this way. So I really loved it. And again, I'm so sorry to like keep referencing like comments that you left on our videos. If this is the first video that somebody's watching, just us, be, um, please, I highly recommend, even if you don't go watch the whole videos, Stephen's comments, top notch every week. Indeed. Love them. Indeed. Um, but you mentioned that like these first four chapters were you sort of like sticking it to critics who said that you couldn't mm -hmm. stick with it. I'm very mm -hmm. interested to hear that you felt like it was such a treat to write as well because I was wondering, oh, man, did you yeah. get positive feedback from those critics? Did it, I would thought that no. maybe there's a world where it felt restrictive <laughs> no. to you because no, of no, it's, it's how you usually write. It's, no, it's constrained. Um, and there's something absolutely fabulous when you, when you are given the opportunity to constrain the language um, and, and the point of view. Um, because that allows, you know, the characters, like, say, like Bayroth and, and Delam Sword, who are actually more precipient than Carson. Yeah, yeah. More aware of, right. of the situation and the dynamics. Because they mm -hmm. would be. Because they, um, they're not the alpha male, right? They're mm -hmm. the next to the alpha male. And if you think nobody would be more aware of the, of, of the um, unspoken politics that are operating in, in, in that power system than the one who's below the alpha male. The alpha yeah. male is not aware of it, right? So, so those characters were, were kind of like ancillary commentators uh, and, and they were recognizing things that Carsa was not recognizing going yeah. all the way But through. that we, the reader, also are recognizing, uh, which is so much fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But also um, that, that first four chapters is, is also foreshadowing uh, the thematic approach on um, cultural relativism because it's from within that culture. And so that within that culture has its own language, it has its own rules. Um, and so it was set up so that the reader was going to be immediately challenged um, because of that notion of, of uh, not just killing children, which you then realize is a, um, an, an assumption on a linguistic basis that they're not children, they're just mm -hmm. normal people. Um, but also the uh, ritualized um, impregnation of women uh, who have been, who are in uh, a band whose male members have now just been killed, mm -hmm. right? Or the other, other way around too, um, if, if all the female uh, or female warriors had come in, it would have possibly gone the other way around. But anyways, mm -hmm. this being, these being actual cultural practices. And of course, what happens is uh, a lot of readers completely recoil from that, right? It's just like, no, this is rape. And, and so you're left with the question of, well, you know, um, if you hold to that notion of cultural relativism, then you don't have an argument. 
But if there is a higher level of, not higher, but um, a kind of a moral stance that, that potentially sits outside of, of cultural considerations, um, right? It, it, is there a, a, a universal human condition of, of, of ethics, uh, of a moral position? Um, and does it come down to um, volition of the individual and free will, mm -hmm. right? So if you hold to that, then yes, you do object. But you object not to what well, one hopes. Anyways, you object not to the actual participants within that culture doing something, but to the culture itself mm. for having created a scenario that allows mm -hmm. this. Yeah. And that's kind of what's heading, that's what Bidethal, it's heading towards Bidethal at that point. Yeah. Right. But I think that so, e even Karsa comes to that conclusion, right? It's like he blames the 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 meta uh, sweeps of history that have uh, converged to make this all the case, and and he, yeah. you know, the gods uh, a higher a higher force, and I think that's yeah, and and, and Icarium, who yeah, thought he right. was doing the right thing, you mm -hmm. know? right, right, yeah, we haven't even. Oh my gosh, Talked I like forgot. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that explosive <laughs> moment. Um, I really like that the way that that you know the ritualistic impregnation scenes were handled because I remember I, you know, I do I talk about having like a goldfish memory, so I hope I'm not misremembering entirely. But my recollection is that because it became very clear in that moment that this was like not just Carsa, Bitterfall, and Delam Thord being monsters Bayroth, all the women were Bayroth, like yeah. oh yeah. bayroth what did i say you said bitathol it's okay oh That's yeah okay. um uh all the women were like well you, you killed all the men well i guess we'll do what comes next but there is still that edge of cruelty on carsa where she's like yeah but not like in my house with the gun mm -hmm. like and he's like "That's exactly where we're going sweetie uh yeah. and so there is yeah. still like an edge there oh, and yeah. i think that balance between like understanding this is expected whether you like it or not they are expecting this as a part of their society just very yeah. very well you balanced don't, you don't let the reader off the hook you, yes you, it's still it's still repugnant you know oh, yes still, oh, yeah. you know? <laughs> but yeah. but by the end of the the novel if you were to ask yourself would Carson do that now right having gone what he's gone through exactly um my yeah. hope is the answer would be probably not yeah I mean, right. just the fact that, like, one of the last things he says, he's like, I think I'm done with saying the word vow yeah. anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that last act of mercy that he has with, um, <laughs> so, what's her name? The the bone, the uh, head, head and shoulders? Sabal. Uh, Sabal, oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. That act of mercy, I think, s speaks volumes, too, because he's come to this place that, that he would never have done something like that in the first four chapters of the, the novel. No. No. Yeah. Um, there is an essay, which I guess you can probably read now if, if you're at all interested. It's, it's called The Problem of Carsa Orlong uh, that I wrote quite some time ago. Um, you can probably find it somewhere. Um, oh, I have to, Google have to check that out. Uh, right. Well, we, you know, as much as I like Carsa Orlong, <laughs> I can't, not my favorite character in the novel. That no. distinction, that distinction belongs to Korab. Korab. <laughs> and I have to, I have to ask you yeah. about Korab. Because yeah. uh, where did that notion come from? Like, is there, is there an origin to just the luckiest man on earth as a yeah, character? Yeah, there is. There is. <laughs> um, when, when Cam and I were gaming, um, I think we created, or I created a character called Jorik. And this was, you could tell that we'd gone to sort of absurd lengths with, with some of our naming conventions. Um, his name was uh, Jorik Sharplands. And um, yeah, he was he was uh, an unkillable character, basically. and that, that that was the play on it was that um, yeah his his luck was just going to be absolutely absurd, um, and um, when I remember talking to Cam because he was doing Jorik was uh, in the Crimson Guard, so it was all Cam's storylines, and Cam just said he was going to mention Jorik every now and then, and we might see him in, in a later book, um, so. Uh, in lieu of, of Jorik, uh, I took that sort of inspiration for, for Korab as this 
uh, yeah, literally the luckiest character around. Um, <laughs> utterly unkillable. Um, <laughs> but he he developed uh, in, in a way I, I didn't originally expect. So um, when you return to him, and you will, uh, you're going to get a lot more of Korob. Oh, good. I, I'm <laughs> excited. <laughs> uh, the scene of Korob and, and Leoman running in of like the showdown of Karsa and the and the Hound of Shadow, and then the horse just running in and hitting the shadow and them flying, like lives in my head, red, head uh, red dude, free. It's my, so, my, so good. <laughs> I, I, my favorite is going all the way underneath the horse and around yeah. the other side. That's that's genius. I just uh, can't even. Uh, what's well, the, the, those things are fun to, fun to write, obviously, um, and a lot of fun to sort of try to work out the choreography of that. You know, is, is it impossible? That kind of thing, but yeah, it, it's fun. Yeah, it's just just delightful. Um, we have some uh, questions from our Discord. Mm-hmm. Uh, although, where did they go? Oh, I think I lost them in my sheet here. Lana, did we move them? Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, I will uh, check uh. the history while you find another question, possibly. Yes. Um, some folks were very excited to be able to ask you questions. So um, you just mentioned naming conventions, uh, talking about uh, your time uh, gaming with um, uh, Mr. Esselmont. Um This comes from Plugo, who I think has his own naming conventions, mm. or their own naming conventions. Uh, Plugo says, um, do you have any kind of naming convention? Over the course of the book, we're introduced to characters with multiple different names, but also we encounter variations of names where it seems like a city or a thing might have also been named after them, or the name of a character might also be a description of who they are or what they do. Is there a deeper layer to the story being told in the use of these names? Um, Okay, there's, there was a naming convention that applied to the Malaysian soldiers. Um, And we had kind of an origin for that, that related to, um, a particular uh, master sergeant uh, named Raven Tooth, um, who just made up names for people, um, and of course that that harkens back to um, what Glenn Cook was doing with the Black Company, and Glenn Cook's naming conventions in the Black Company related to his life experiences uh, in the Vietnam War. So um, there, that's the linkage for those ones. But of course, some cultures uh, hold to almost um, a, a, a sacred position for, for naming. Um, and so those, cu- those cultures will have individuals who are going to resist that, uh, that invented name uh, practice. Um, so it's more a case of um, thinking about the culture that the character has come from um, and then Thinking in terms of you know is it a, is it a, a culture where where um, you know say ancestor worship in which case uh, the naming conventions are extremely important and, and not something to be messed with um, or is it a culture that hides its true names uh, for for people so there's, there's all different approaches to to uh, to that naming stuff um, as for um, inventing them. Um, I, I, that's kind of mysterious. Uh, some days uh, I'm in, uh, in the perfect mood to invent, you know, the names of a whole squad. And other days, other days I'm not. So, <laughs> so it, that may be the source of some variation uh, in the naming convention. Um, yeah, but I, 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 I do play around with with um, with names. Uh, you haven't read any of the Bokelin or Corbett Brooch novellas, but um, sometimes I, I'll come up with a name that's more Dickensian than I think than anything else, right? So um, I'm trying to remember the name of one of them. Uh, I can't remember her first name, but her second name is Spilibus. <laughs> and it's just, it's just, you, yeah, you, you're juxtaposing um, aspects of, of our own our own language. Um, and just flipping them around or messing with them somewhere. Yeah. 
Um, here's a question from uh, Sorov, who is one of our uh, our folks that helps us decide which how many chapters to read each week. Very much in in his debt. Um, oh yeah, doing a great job. Uh, yeah, I agree. I'm so so grateful for that. Uh, Sorov uh, says Fel- Felicity's whole arc in Dead House Gates was her taking agency at the end after everything she had suffer- suffered after her lashing out at everyone because everything felt out of her control. She finally got some agency when she became Shaikh. But in House of Chains, suddenly that takes a back seat. Throughout the book, she suddenly becomes just a vessel for the goddess, and her agency is gone. Mm -hmm. And it's not even a gradual process. From the very first, we see the goddess in full control. Mm -hmm. Do you think this invalidates some of her growth after what happened in the last book? Yeah, she is is definitely stalled um, because of the... Uh, it's not just Sheik's um, control over her. Um, it's Sheik's emotional landscape of, of uh, an obsessive uh, desire for, for revenge um, and hatred of the world, uh, hatred against the world. Um, and those, those definitely um, twist um, uh, Felicity's own uh, psyche. I mean, she's young, right? She's she's not prepared for, for any of this stuff. Um, and nothing in her experiences have prepared her for it. If anything, um, she's more vulnerable than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, she loses, or so it's not a question necessarily of, of uh, her. I mean, she, she she's lost her agency for a lot of it. Um, and you see at one point, I can't remember, is it, Habork who walks in and briefly strips away Shaikh's or yeah, could be Lord, pushes Lord. her into the tent. Yeah, and she yeah uh, the, yeah the wards um, make her yeah. So so there's beautiful there's scene. One, well, yeah. there's that one moment where Shaikh comes back, or I mean, Felicity comes back. Yeah, and she's yeah. utterly bewildered. Um, and she has this realization of yeah. all the things you wanted her to realize in the previous novel. Those, and then, yeah. yeah, it's gone. Those yeah. two glimmers of hope that are offered, one right in that moment, and then Heberick's like, well, this can't be, and then sort of kicks her back out into, the, you know, being possessed again. And then at that, the end, when the whirlwind goddess is destroyed and she has this moment, mm-hmm. you know, folks who have listened to us through the past few books know that I was not the Felsa fan before. Mm-hmm. Um, but like just rooting for her, just take off the helmet, just, just, just say something, just I'm your say sister. anything. Just say it. Mm. Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. it enhanced mm. that tragedy to the nth degree for me to have those moments of seeing this person who could possibly just be herself yeah. uh, for those moments. Oh, heartbreaking. Well, and that's, it goes back to, um, why it took so long to write those scenes because you know I've watched enough film and television to, to, to see that there's a this convention that writers use where uh, a lot of the conflict between two characters is actually generated by the fact that the characters don't say the right thing at the right time um, they don't say the obvious thing mm-hmm. uh, and and so and then everything spalls off um, in that you know, different directions um, and if it's if it if it if it's done in such a way that it, it feels organic and real, um, then it, it works, right? Um, but of course, often you see it it's 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 not done in, in a realistic way, and, and everybody you know, you're sitting watching it, and, and you know, my wife and I would turn to each other and say, well, in those circumstances, no, you would say this, and yeah. that would just yes. solve all the problems, right? <laughs> right. You say, right. I mean, come on, yeah. Um, so. That's why it, it becomes so car- uh, so uh, challenging to um, compose the scene in such a way that it makes sense in and of itself. Um, that the things that are not said um, actually seems internally consistent. Um, and it's not so. It was not a case of uh, Felicin, um not saying those things. It was a case of her not having time to say those things, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. um, when when that sort of um, uh, Sheikh's disappearance um, frees her up again, um, it's it's a simple gesture of, of just raising a hand, but the hand happened to hold a sword. 
and that was immediately seen as a threatening or preparatory gesture uh, in, in the combat, and Tabor immediately reacts to it. And so she just doesn't get time to actually pull off the helmet or say anything. Um, mm-hmm. But it takes a lot to, you got to write your way up to that moment so that it actually, you know, step by step, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Another question from the uh, the audience here. Um, th- this one, I think I've heard you talk about this, but uh, I'd love to hear you talk about it again. This one comes from the one who had Tehol's blanket. I don't know what that reference is. Maybe something later. You will. Maybe. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the question is, uh, I believe some of the conversations between Pearl and Lestara Yill are based on you and your wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, they want to you to speak to a little bit about that. My, I think my question to add on to it uh, is uh, when your wife read <laughs> those exchanges, did she recognize that? She sure as hell did. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I mean, I don't know if it's, it's, it's almost a, it's a comedy stick that we can move into um, Claire and I. Um, and it does happen. It, it's, it's, it's not a serious engagement, but it's, it's, um, it is a performance in some respect and, and we do it to amuse each other basically. Um, <laughs> and so you take these stances that, that are, are just completely, you know, not only, I mean, they're opposites, but they're absurd at the same time. And uh, I tend to take on the absurd role and she tends to be, you know, yeah, the voice of reason and all of it. <laughs> so, yeah, there there were there are lines here and there that um, I just uh, yeah I drew from memory and and basically threw in there because there's a kind of flirtation thing that's going on between um, Pearl and Lostera, but also Pearl's just a complete twat, and you know I'm sure I'm a <laughs> complete twat on occasion. So uh, and, and so it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, and and, and he's definitely not a character who. Um, takes takes things too seriously, despite you know things that can happen. That um, uh, there would be the expectation to actually you know um, take seriously. Mm-hmm. Did you did you intend the uh, the notion of him leaving a pearl on the on the chest <laughs> as being a funny? <laughs> well, yeah, we found that so, hilarious. Yeah, no, he's, yeah. There, there's a lot of affectation uh, in, that, in, in pearl. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a Does, lot of anybody else would just roll their eyes, you know, upon seeing this. But no, <laughs> right. he, he he's got the clothes. He, he's he's a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's he's, like he's, authentic. He's like that was a cool thing to do. Yeah, yeah exactly. He's, yeah. Yeah. he's drinking his own Kool Aid there. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the other the other characters that we absolutely loved for their comedic. I mean, it's it's just so wonderful how funny these novels are while dealing with these big heavy themes as well. Uh, but the <laughs> the Tisleus Leosin. Oh my um, gosh. And how you, you set up this wonderful convergence and there's all these parties coming and here are these knuckleheads that show up at the end are just completely undermined. I, I wonder if you could speak to, I mean, is that, that felt to me like a, maybe an inside joke or something. Yeah. Is there yeah. Ken got really mad at me. For that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, because he, he, he uh, I mean, Osric was one of his role played characters. Um, and, a lot of the game where he we played a role um, as an NPC um, were the games that I was playing uh, Animata Rake and company. Um, so in those campaigns, uh, Osric was an NPC. Um, Lady Envy was an NPC. So Cam was playing uh, both these characters. Um, and I had Rake and, and, and Brood for the most part. Um, and it just turned out that Osric was a, a eternal foil for, for Animata Rake in the gaming um, and frustrated the living crap out of me. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so yeah, there's an inside joke regarding me uh, taking the Leosin and, and, you know, absolutely uh, trashing the reputation. <laughs> yeah, so he was picked off. Yeah. It's very funny. I, I just lo- I love how he, yeah, they just show up and are like, well, we should let's just leave. Um, <laughs> it's the juxtaposition of the extreme com- 
confidence yeah, yeah. and yeah. in their own competence and then immediately they're like mm, all the buggies gave us bug bites <laughs> and then it's just yeah. downhill from there <laughs> they're just pretty much not in this yeah. world sweetheart so good. <laughs> yeah. uh, this leads uh, to a great question from um uh another listener this is a foul fo- <laughs> focaccia foul focaccia writes um wow what an awesome opportunity uh here's my question uh when you were rping which character was your favorite to role play that made it into the series? And what differences did that favorite role played character have compared to the character as it appears in the, in the novels? Wow. Okay. Um, so he says, please do, please answer this question with as little spoilers for future things as possible. Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. But I mean, there's, yeah. So it's actually two questions. If, if I understood yeah. that correctly. Um, Favorite character to role play. Um, I would think it would be Krupp. Uh, <laughs> probably my favorite character to role play. Yeah, there's no way you came up with that kind of dialogue on the fly in an improvisational way, right? I mean, that just seems. He, he's, oh no, he's, no, no! I, believe me, I, I, I can, I can. That's um, incredible. No, I can, I can spout out nonsense uh, <laughs> at ad infinitum. Um, in the third person, especially. Um, <laughs> there was another character that I really enjoyed. Um, well, two of them. Um, but they they play roles in Cam's books. And it was um, a priest named Ipshank and um, a thief named Manask. And uh, so I, I won't give anything more away than that. Because... Uh, when Cam, when Cam, especially with Manas, when Cam delivers Manas in, in his, his books, um, it, even better than the character I played by far. Um, so, and what was the second part of that question? Was uh, how uh, do, how did they how were they different between their role playing versions and how they appear in the novels? Right. Um, I, I don't know. Hmm, I don't know the extent to where they were. Um, I think that they're pretty consistent with how I sort of envisioned them. Um, in, uh, in like between uh, the game, the game version, the, the written up characters, and um, and how they were written in the novels. I, I don't think I did much in the way of deviation on that, um, especially since. A good many of uh, uh, principal characters were never gamed at all. They, they're entirely fictional creations, like um, Ganos Peran, uh, Crocus, um, uh, Sari, uh, or Absalar. Um, you know, all, all fairly major, and, and Icarium and Mappo and all the rest. Uh, none of them were, were uh, in the games. Um, but Talana Mass. Um, I actually did play. I played uh, almost. I played Tool. Uh, oh maybe, really? I must have oh. played him as an NPC though. Huh. Um, and so, uh, yeah, some of the the traditional, well, the characteristic dryness of the Toledo Mass sense of humor, for example, or rather, their non sense of humor, um, is is pretty consistent. Uh, I think between, although. The game, the game versions of the Talana Mass tended to be more comedic, believe it or not. <laughs> and the ja- the Jagut were less comedic in the games and much more comedic in the books. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't have thought you, about it. Have you ever? I feel like this would maybe be too, uh, like, intimate in a way. Have you ever, like, played the characters for an audience, either just locally to where you are, or as a part of like? online like sharing with people like the moments of like i would be so fascinated to see what it looks like to to play them with like intent um no we never have um i had to kind of do that when cam moved away and i moved i moved away where i ended up with a group of five people um in the malazan world and those five characters you've all met um, you've also met Karsa, who was also a, a character uh, rolled up by somebody. Um, mm-hmm. 
who wasn't aware his character was a giant uh, in the same fashion as you saw in the book. He had no idea. I said, yeah, you're, you're heading down the, you know, down into the valleys and into the lowlands to kill children. And he just sort of stared at me and said, what? <laughs> yeah, it's all right. This is it. Here's your story. So, so those first four chapters in House of Chains are the, the campaign I, I, um, oh, wow. I did for, for Carson. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, even his, you know, as, as he played it, um, he's going to raid this village of this little small community of Silver Lake. And, you know, when the horse comes around the corner and he sees a walled town, um, the question was, what are you going to do? Right. And he said, I keep going. And so that's how that whole story of him. And I think hmm. Bellum and, and Bayroth are probably not in the I think it was just him in the game. Yeah. So a one man army basically <laughs> and he attacks the town and he gets he gets his ass kicked um, <laughs> so so you know that that's one of those instances where what is what what occurs within the game uh, that, that you're playing is simply too good not to use yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so later on um, yeah you've met you met all the players uh, uh, um, the later games, um, these five people, all of whom are actually, um, they're still there and playing by the, the, the end of the 10th book. So, um, there's huge elements, uh, that was, that were games that, that are now, you know, part of the, um, uh, the 10 book series. And so that's why from, I think maybe from, well, this one is dedicated to the guy who played Carsa, uh, Mark, Mark Paxton McCray, uh, House of Chains. And I think the rest of them are all dedicated to e at least, well, to one of those. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. What, a dis what a distinction to have, have your character I know. You know, brought, brought to life like that. That's no, so neat. Uh, um, and they got also got one inspiration point for the next <laughs> session. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're fascinated by the shared brain you had to have with uh Ian Esselmont um Cam yeah yeah Cam you're uh, you know obviously close friends obviously you know collaborated on the the origins of this whole universe but as things progressed and it became you know you're into your fourth book writing your fourth book he's starting on his books how is it possible with the level of depth and complexity and and you've got an idea over here that he doesn't necessarily sign off on and vice versa how, how does that how is that manageable uh i don't think we really we never panicked about it um hmm. because we had gamed uh, so extensively uh, and, and in the process of gaming created and invented the back history uh to the malaysian uh world um it was only a question of if one of us needed to contact the other for confirmation whether we remembered something correctly, mm. um, or where did you leave that character? In, you know, in in, in your book. Um, yeah. So I already knew. I mean, we'd already sort of split things up where um, he was going to basically take the story of the Crimson Guard, who you meet briefly in um, Gardens of the Moon. Um. And run with that one, and I was going to run with the other stuff. Um, right. So there was a lot of um, a lot of freedom, I think, um, that we both um, expected of each other, and mm -hmm. and took that as a challenge and as a way in which we could be writing these novels, even though you know elements of them may have been game together. Um, we were that stuff was more backstory than anything else. Um, and so we were continuing our adventures, uh, continuing the same um, uh, mutual exercises of entertainment um, that we did in the, the one on one gaming, but we continued it in, into, into the novel writing itself. So uh, I, I always wrote with an audience of one, which was kind of, <laughs> and, you know, so there would be, a, you know, in jokes in there all over the place. Um, and there are. <laughs> It's, it's, it's extraordinary to see to, that that worked, you know, it's just amazing. Um, 
I wanted to ask a few questions about writing, but Landa, if there's anything, please jump in. But I, I you know, I love hearing you talk about writing uh, in general. And I'm wondering when you sit down to write for the day, you've, you've, you've carved out time, you're going to have a few hours to write. Is there anything you do before the first finger hits the keys? Is, is there sure. anything... Uh, are you I, reading what you wrote the previous session or what, what, what yeah. is your process? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I read and do a light uh, edit if necessary of the previous section. Mm. And that gets me back into the, the, the cadence and the rhythm um, of what I was doing. Um, these days it also reminds me what, what I was doing because, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> memory is not what it used to be. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, and that, that just brings me back into the rhythm. Um, I remember reading, I think it was Hemingway advising for, for, for writers, um, never write yourself into, into weariness or exhaustion in, in a session. Hmm. Um, finish when the energy is still high. Hmm. And his argument was that way when you come back to it uh, the next day, you can pick up where you left off in terms of energy level. Because if you write yourself down, then... You know, you got this happening, and then yeah. the next day it goes back. It has to somehow drag itself back up. Not only that, you don't just have to drag itself back up, but you have to go back and fix the last part <laughs> of your writing session beforehand because it didn't have that that um, energy uh, suffusing it. Yeah. How do you so, have the awareness? Like, how do you recognize when you're starting? Like, the energy levels are starting to turn. Is it just that you're kind of like, uh, like you're unfocused? So you could feel your like brain going around, like. How do you train yourself to recognize that moment? I feel like I would miss it every time. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm not. I'm never worried about word counts. Um, so basically, I've got a, a certain amount of time allotted, hmm. um, and I've learned to experience, and it changes. I used to be four hours a day, and now it's two. Um, but as I'm closing in on on the two hours, uh, experience has taught me that. That's where I stop. Mm. Um, and so I try to try to, you know, write in such a fashion that um, the last sentence I write is a strong sentence in some mm. fashion. Uh, and that tells me that, okay, the energy level is, is good at, at this point. Now's a good time to stop. And it's two hours have passed. So, so mm. there's other ways of, of sort of managing this because you're right. Um, sometimes you, you're not quite sure uh, whether you've, um, whether the sparks have dimmed a little bit uh, or, or, or the wood has all burned down. Um, and if you've got a very specific time and you're not worried about word count, um, uh, you stop at that point. Uh, it's an arbitrary set, whatever that time is, and that's where you stop. And then mm -hmm. I think what happens is your creative process gets habituated to stopping at that point. And so it stops on, it, it, it maintains all the energy it needs until that point and then stops. Huh. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm very curious uh, because I've experienced this in a, in a slight degree. It, in what ways does being a writer inform or intrude on the rest of your life? I, do you walk around the world uh, living inside your fantasy world to a certain extent? Are you, you know, always sort of attuned to things that you can pluck out and place in your fiction? How does your day-to-day -day life change because of your profession? Right. Um, there's, there's, there's two sides to, to my answer on that one. Um, there's the external side. There's how do, how do other people see you if, if you are a writer and, and, um, I can only speak from those closest, you know, to, to my experience in my life, uh, around me. Um, and for example, uh, my wife would always say that, that her mother, um, would always kind of defend my sanctity, if you will, that she would say, oh no, he's, he's thinking about deep thoughts. Don't bother him. <laughs> And of course, my wife is like, "Yeah, he's not thinking about these. He's thinking about hockey, you know, whatever." <laughs> so, so she knew better. But so there was that sensibility out there that um, I'm always engaged in the process of writing, and in a sense, they're both right, right? Um, 
I think I think an artist has as a proclivity, um, and it's a procl proclivity to seeing things around you in in a way that's not typical, uh, not necessarily healthy either, but just not typical. Mm. Um, and so we know, you know, we know details that that uh, other people don't, but other people know details that we don't. All right. So, I mean, the classic example, like is what when, time to appear at a place yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or, whether, or the, you know, whether the kids need toothpaste. <laughs> got it, got it, yeah. Um, and yeah, you can romanticize that and say, you know, he, she is often a dream world. Um, and it's partly true. Um, but I don't think it's something that is, is we're conscious of or willful towards. Um, so, you know, an example would be you're walking with your partner and, and you pass by a couple and your partner says, did you see those shoes? And you say, what? What shoes? Right. <laughs> you didn't notice, but you did notice something just, you know, over that over that corner there, a little a, a gesture somebody made on, on a bark bench or bark park bench somewhere. Yeah, that was really quite interesting. And that then sinks in there. And so you're picking up. Not you're almost picking up on a subtextual level, um, um, so that um, you're almost looking for a symbolic meaning mm. um, in things you see, or things that could potentially contain symbolic meaning, even if they don't now. Um, and like I say, it's 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 uh, it's both a virtue and a flaw. <laughs> so. Those moments where you pick up on things, I mean, maybe not when you're walking down the street, obviously, but because you are noticing these things, do you ever find that you are like struck by the, the moment? You're like, I've, I, I just, I witnessed this thing. I saw that gesture on the bench and it reminded me of this thing. And I've made these connections and I must, I must write now. Or does keeping the schedule of saying I'm doing two hours at this time sort of regulate that? you find you, yeah, you have I, more I, bounced writing that way yeah i think it does i mean there are times when when yeah i wish I'd, I'd i have a sentence when i'm walking or something that i wish i'd written down mm -hmm. or even a whole idea um but you don't keep a, a notepad or anything on you anything like that uh, I, I don't reach for the notepad when i'm walking no <laughs> but there, i mean there's there's a built-in rhythm to walking that actually is great for composing sentences poets mm -hmm. do it a lot right so um so there is that, but then, yeah, there's, there's certainly, but no, even the instances where, where I'm sort of struck with, with some kind of wonder or, um, you know, uh, something sends shivers through me, whatever. Um, I, I make a point not to write immediately afterwards. I need to let that settle and sink in. Huh. Uh, and percolate. Interesting. Um, because I mean, Every writer is writing from from their life experience, and and what is in your life experience is all you need in order to write. Um, it's what you do with that stuff. It's what you do with the memories and 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 the images that you've seen and and um, the things you've lived through. Um, it's, it, in and of themselves, they are, in a sense, almost inert. There, there, there's there's nothing there. But what you do with them. Um, is is part of that creative process i think um so in a sense i guess you're trying to make sense of the world through through your art uh and it's the only way you know how and so mm. it's what you're stuck with so then to to bring you back to house of chains for, for mm -hmm. just a, a moment do you have siblings i have an older brother five years older does does any part of House Paran or, or the like the relationships throughout is that has that been inspired by any experiences that you've had with your brother? No, not really. <laughs> no, um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, no, no, we we we, we grew up. I don't know. Very different, very different personalities, very different worlds. Um, mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that, that even though we we um, 
we can be fairly infrequent in our communication, even though he just lives across uh, in, in Chilliwack. Um, when we do, we just we just slot back into place and, and we get along yeah. really well. Um, Is he an artist? A uh, musician. Oh, cool. Yeah. The one thing uh, I never had was musical talent and, and he had it. Uh, and that seemed to be part of that uh, my father's family line, um, either musicians uh, or, or painters, um, that kind of stuff. So there's was, was always art somewhere involved there. But yeah, he got I the just, music side. Yeah. That's so cool. I, I just was telling Lan, I, I just listened to your interview with the 10 Very Big Books podcast about this novel where you revealed that your father may have been the inspiration for the Swedish chef, <laughs> which yes, is yes. mind blowing. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> a long story, but yeah, I, I, I'm about 80%. Uh, <laughs> I think that's incredible. <laughs> and anyway, we won't make you recount that, that you can, people can yeah. listen to that other podcast, but I was, I was very jealous that they got that story on their show. <laughs> it was very, very cool. Um, yeah, another thing about, you know, we're, so we're four novels in. Mm hmm my understanding uh, again trying to avoid spoilers for future things but my understanding is that this book has sort of kicked off a new phase of how the series is going to go <clears throat> and i'm very excited for that but uh just you know based on my experience with these four novels i find it so interesting you know anytime i've read um a multi installment series most often they'll read like serialized mm -hmm. storytelling. So we're, you know, baby steps, the, the story forward. Uh, you know, it's basically, you know, Luke at the end of empire standing there going, boy, I sure hope we can get Han back at the, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's serialized. Right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like these novels so far have been, uh, while clearly there are elements of that, they have had such satisfying arcs and conclusions. You know, I assumed the Panny and Domen were going to last for multiple books. You know, mm. I assumed the the Jagged Tyrant from De from uh, Gardens of the Moon was going to last multiple books. It felt, you know, you have these self contained, almost episodic adventures in each book, and I'm curious if that is something that was important to you to have each novel be, have a beginning, middle and end uh, and not yeah. just feel like the next step of the thing. Yeah. I think um, I really wanted a sense of uh, completion for the reader, uh, at least of, of principal storylines. Uh, you had the, the arc that's <coughs> carried by the characters through the entire 10 book series, some of the characters. Um, but I, I remember growing up of, of always being frustrated of um, books where I had to wait for the next one to come out in order to find out, you know, what was going to happen. I, I didn't like cliffhangers. Um, so I wanted a, a good sense of completion, um, some kind of a emotional cathartic tie up um, by the end of the books. Um, so the only place where that, that breaks down is books nine and 10. Um, that's actually one giant novel. So that's the only cliffhanger in the series. Um, I can tell you that now because you'll have forgotten by the time you get there. So <laughs> I, I just need this much time to brace myself emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're lucky. You know, the books have all been written. We're not yeah. waiting for the next publication yeah. date, you know? <laughs> exactly. exactly. And so, um, yeah, Midnight Tides is definitely one of those novels that seem to write itself. Um, and I just sort of sat back. Um, but I knew there was a, it was a huge shift, but it is, it's already been set up. It's been set up for, for you having, um, I don't know if I should give that much away. It's not much to give away. Is it much? Don't, don't do it. I'll like, <laughs> I'll throw, I'm like, see, one of the things I love, like it's not <laughs> episodic, but there are like clear mysterious pieces that I want to know more about. One of the big ones Jeff and I talked about last week, you know, we expected uh, to hear more about the House of Chains as as in the literal, in the sense of the world, like Deck of Dragons, House of Chains is now in the deck. Crippled God. Crippled yeah. God, House of yeah. Chains. So there's like a big, like, what is, let's, let's learn more about it. What's that? But like something that has been just eating away in my brain is like, we took that lady out from under the rock in the first four <laughs> chapters. Calm, where you at? 
Where you at? I'm not feeling calm about calm. Just being out there. So. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, cer- I certainly wouldn't feel calm about calm. Um, uh, that's one of the ones where I think it's safe to say you can put that on the shelf for a while. <laughs> um, and even even the, the House of Chains um, as a, a deck manifestation. Um, it's now simply part of the the makeup of the world, and mm. so you know it's not going to be. It's now intrinsic intrinsic to the world. It's bound to the world. Um, so characters are going to respond and react to it in the same fashion that they would any of the other houses, um, as opposed to, and 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 yeah, there are roles um, that are still to be assumed, and. Uh, you are, are, are rapidly heading towards um, one aspect of that resolution mm. in the very next book. Um, I, can, I can tell you that. I mean, yeah. um, the crippled god got to get a new leper. Uh, <laughs> no, not, not entirely. Um, actually, yes. But the, the thing is, this is why I was hemming and hawing about whether I can indicate this, but I think it's, it's fair to say that. The setup for Midnight Tides um, is to be found in the one of the unresolved storylines in House of Chains. Yeah. And the sixth book is the other unresolved storyline. <laughs> so I'm going to do a quick reread, but before Midnight Tides of House of Chains, <laughs> really let it sink in. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go far back. You go back. You can go back. Um, two of your discussions, uh, okay. not the last one, but I think the one before, uh, where where Jeff asks a very obvious question and expresses a certain amount of frustration that it wasn't answered. <laughs> and it, it's sitting right there. So. Uh, well, I'm excited to find the answer. Me too. Uh, very excited to jump into Midnight Tides, which will be our, our next episode. I think we're going to take a week off, mm-hmm. uh, folks, for uh, for just to sort of reset ourselves, let everything sink in, and then we'll dive into that novel. But uh, Stephen, as usual, this has been just a delight and, and what a treat for us. So thank you very much for being with us again and, and sharing all your thoughts about, about writing and about House of Chains. Uh, we really appreciate it. Well, again, thank you for, for actually yeah, being my, my absolute perfect readers. <laughs> it blows my mind. So I appreciate that. Uh, I, I can't believe it took me. It, I, I think I mm-hmm. mentioned this to you before. It took me a decade between when I put this on my two read list on Goodreads to mm-hmm. when we finally started. The, and I think it was serendipity. It was fate because I wouldn't have read it with Lana and I'm having such a blast reading it with her. But um I, I do feel like this this was the fantasy series I've been searching for for so long. And I just <laughs> it just languished on my two reads. And now here we are. I'm finally enjoying it. So um, thank you again. And uh, yeah. just so, well, so, so much fun. I mean, it, it's fortuitous also that it's finished. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Do you have. And, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, I was just gonna. Add, there has been some kind of whispers in the community about, hey, maybe after book five, after Midnight Tides, we go and read. There's a evidently a book that kind of fits in mm-hmm. between five and six that we may. How, do you have any feelings on that? Should we just plow through the ten and then do the ancillary oh, you mean, novels? You mean Cam's? One, um, yeah, um, yeah, the publication order books. Yeah, Night of Knives. Um, mm, that's the one. I don't know. I don't know. Um, all right. That's fair. I, I, we haven't even talked about it at all, but there's been some people in the community that are like, Man, maybe you should, uh, you know, uh, whatever. But we'll, yeah, we'll figure it out. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, part of the, the, the publication um, sequence is not, in, it's not sort of intrinsic to um, the novels themselves and, and the story being told. Uh, it was more a case of... Um, it took Cam a while to uh, get up to speed, and I think I was—I probably finished the fourth book by the, by the time his uh, his first one was coming out. So that's just sort of the real world situation has actually shaped the publication order. I mean, mm. we took it into account um, so that you could read them in, in parallel if you wanted to, um, 
because we always viewed our novel writing to each other as as a continuation of a dialogue. And so there is that element is, is definitely there. Um, is is that is that unique to uh, do you know of other two other authors that have done something similar? Um, I'm aware of of uh, Tim Powers and and Blaylock, um, but that's more a case of in jokes um, <laughs> running all the way through um, between uh, between them. Um, I think there was a third person involved in that stuff as well. But uh, no, I, I, I mean, Thieves' World um, was a collected, collected author set in the same world. Um, I don't know, to, I don't remember uh, to what extent the individual storylines uh, in, intertwined or engaged with each other. I'm not sure. Well, thanks again for being with mm. us. We are uh, grateful for your time and yes. uh, can't wait for everybody uh, to see you in the next novel, Midnight Tides. Uh, stay tuned. Please subscribe and we'll be, uh, we'll be at you in just a couple of weeks. Thanks. Take care. Take care.